Have them. Um, he's now the Europe disintegration correspondent uh, in Central Europe, based in Budapest. Um, that's his joke. I should give him full <laughs> footnote credit. Uh, but but it's it's really been a pleasure for a lot of us in this field to read his dispatches from the former Soviet Union um, and to have him here with us today. Um, I'm going to ask Sean to kick things off and, and talk a little bit about the book. Um, then I'll ask him a few questions, and then we'll open things up for discussion. So anyway, Sean, welcome to Carnegie. Um, the floor is yours. Thanks very much for inviting me, and thanks uh, for coming. Uh, so yeah, I'm just going to say, just talk for a few minutes um, about the book, and then I'll be happy to take any questions about the book or about sort of where we are in, in Russia more generally. Um, so yeah, as, as Andrew mentioned, I, um, I've been in Russia for, for about 13, 14 years. Uh, I actually first visited Moscow um, as an 18-year-old in January 2000, a couple of weeks after Putin uh, had taken over as acting president. Uh, and I'm leaving uh, just before he gets another six years. Um, and so this book is kind of my attempt to make sense of this 18-year period um, and to look at Putin's attempts to create uh, a sense of nation in Russia and overcome the sort of psychological scars of the Soviet collapse. Uh, what I've tried to do is tell these stories through a number of portraits of very different people, whether it's a separatist commander in East Ukraine, uh, a war veteran from Stalingrad, Chechen mercenaries, gulag survivors. Uh, Vladimir Putin is a character, um, but he's not necessarily the main character. Um, he's just one more person who was affected by the Soviet collapse. Uh, though, of course, his experiences would go on to be very important for the future of Russia. Um, and I do take as one of my starting points uh, a newspaper column that uh, Putin published in 1999, uh, a few days before Yeltsin made him acting president. And in that column, he bemoaned about how weak Russia had become uh, in the past decade. Putin said that for the first time in 200 to 300 years, Russia faces the real danger that it could be relegated to the second, if not the third tier, of global powers. And he called on Russians to unite to ensure that Russia would remain what he called a first tier nation. So there's a sense that he felt that economic and social indicators were important, but they would come naturally if this first tier status was reattained. And so like with many post-imperial leaders, uh, dealing with a loss of importance seemed more important than the loss of material wealth. So when Putin took over, he knew that he wanted to restore this great power status, but it wasn't really clear exactly what the new Russia should look like, what kind of country it should be. Um, and you know, it's, it's my argument that probably Russia and Ukraine <coughs> were the only two of the 15 countries that came into existence after the Soviet collapse that hadn't by that point come up with a unifying, coherent national narrative. And I think the, the events of 2014, um, which is most of the second half of the book, um, the revolution in Kiev, Russia's annexation of Crimea, and the war in eastern Ukraine, um, those events were at least partly um, about competing Russian and Ukrainian attempts to mint these new national identities. Um, and so the first half of the book is about the creation of this new national idea. And, you know, it's, it's not a new thought that uh, common historical triumphs or defeats are a good way to rally people behind uh, a national idea. Um, and uh, while, you know, the collapse of 1991, that was something that resonated with a lot of people. Uh, and it was something that people could, that Putin could use. Um, playing that card too strongly, this Soviet nostalgia, um, would alienate a lot of younger Russians, a lot of business people um, who enjoyed the new opportunities of capitalism. So Putin kind of equivocated on that. He called the Soviet collapse, as we you know, famously know, the greatest geopolitical tragedy of the 20th century. But he also said that while a person, only a person with no heart, would fail to miss the Soviet Union, but only someone with no head would want to restore it. So instead of focusing on 1991, Putin turned to the one event that kind of had the narrative potential to unite the country and to serve as a foundation stone for a new nation. Uh, and that's the victory in the Second World War, um, or is it still known in Russia, the Great Patriotic War. 
Um, and my main argument in the book is that uh, Putin used this victory um, as a kind of national building block. And obviously part of the reason for this was that much of the Russian war narrative really is incredibly inspiring. Soviet Union did play a decisive role in defeating Nazism, um, and almost every Russian has a personal history relating to the war. Um, so this kind of made the war very real uh, in an important way, um, because you know when you look at today's Russia, um, after the sort of people witnessing the collapse of the Soviet Union and then the disintegration of democratic slogans in the 1990s. Um, there is a sense that Russia is a place where people don't really believe in anything, that when you look at politics, ideas or values are kind of a means to an end rather than something of intrinsic value. And the war was different. It evoked real and genuine feelings in people. And this was something that was noticed in the Kremlin, and I think there was this sort of logical progression. Um, it was a rare source of pride for Russians. Um, you know, if you look at the recent history of Russia, uh, there, weren't that, there aren't that many victories to celebrate. Um, I think of the, the Sochi Olympics opening ceremony where uh, you know, this is a sort of chance to show your view of the sort of glory of your country's history. Uh, and on this particular occasion, there wasn't anything about the Second World War because the Olympics don't allow uh, military imagery. But we had this procession of this beautiful evocation of Tsarist Russia, and we had the industrialization of the 20s and the 30s. And we had Yuri Gagarin going into space in 1961. And then that was the end. Uh, there wasn't anything that was deemed worthy of something that could be proud of or something that could be presented as a great Russian achievement between 1961 and 2014. So, you know, this was something that was a sign of, of Russia winning. Uh, Putin, in fact, in 2000 said to the veterans, through you, we got used to being a nation of winners. And this is kind of an important feeling. But obviously, there were other parts to the war narrative as well. Um, you know, the war wrought such a horrible toll on the Soviet people that it might seem more appropriate as a cause for somber commemoration rather than brash celebration. And aside from the general horrors of war, there was the deportation of around 2 million Soviet citizens, including Crimean Tatars and Chechens. It was the post-war deportations of Balts and Western Ukrainians. And of course, more broadly, there was the regime that had won the war. Um, so you know, while it wasn't Putin's intention to lionize Stalin, if you're going to make the war victory make sense as this national building block, then he at least has to be a neutral figure. The, a victory is not much use if it came about in the service of a criminal regime. So all of these issues and how they played out are things that I cover in detail in the book, and I'd be happy to talk about um, more. Um, the last thing I'd say was that you know it's important to note that in this in this uh, war narrative that um, became so pervasive, both sides were actually painted in black and white. So while on the one hand the more difficult pages of the Soviet war narrative were hushed up. Um, Nazism was also simplified as a concept. So, you know, Nazis don't mean militarism or cult of personality or gas chambers. Nazism means invading the Soviet Union. The cardinal sin of the Nazis was that they invaded the Soviet Union. And so that makes it very easy to transpose this onto the events of the modern day as well. And that's kind of what we saw happen in 2014 uh, during the annexation of Crimea and the separatist movements in East Ukraine, the orange and black St. George's ribbon, which symbolizes the war victory, was almost as common a sight um, as the Russian flag. And so I spent quite a lot of the book talking about those events of 2014. Um, uh, Maidan, Crimea, Donbass, and I think both Russia and Ukraine were working through their attitudes to 1945 and 1991 in those events. And again, I won't go into that in detail here, but I'd be happy to talk more about it. You know, 2014 was obviously this watershed moment uh, in relations between Russia and the West. It was meant to be the year that Russia was going to host the Sochi Olympics and would prove to the world that it was, again, a first-tier nation. And instead, it became the year uh, where Russia uh, asserted itself, if you like, in Ukraine. And from then on, Russia, uh, Putin's messaging became much more nationalistic and ideological. And 2014 actually became uh, a companion date for 1945. 
um, another narrative of Russians triumphing against a powerful energy uh, enemy. Um, so I'll pretty much leave it there. I guess we can, you know, we're now in 2018, and from the, the point of view now, kind of Putin, in many ways, has been quite successful in this in this attempt to recast Russia as a first tier nation. Um, you know, Russia's changed the complexion of the Middle East with the intervention in Syria. The whole world is fretting about Russian interference. Uh, you know, CNN is running a documentary about Putin called "The Most Powerful Man in the World." Um, and internally, too, um, Putin has largely succeeded in this mission of creating a new sense of nation and rallying Russians around a patriotic idea. Um, but instead of transcending the trauma of the Soviet collapse, um, his government has exploited it. Um, and sort of, you know, the traditional models for societies coming out of a dictatorship would be either a reckoning with the past or reconciliation. And Putin's initial goal had been reconciliatory. He wanted to use history to bring the nation together. But it was this kind of reconciliation without the hard work and the discussions required to move on. And it helped create these feelings of victimhood and martyrdom, which would explode in 2014. Uh, and this kind of obsession with the war and of Russia fighting against the world has really formed the basis of the upbringing of a whole new generation of Russians. And I think it will probably kind of continue to endure even uh, if and when uh, Putin finally leaves the Kremlin. Uh, a recent incident with this school schoolboy who was giving a speech in the Bundestag uh, when he spoke about feeling pity for some of the Nazi soldiers that had died and sort of led to this tremendous backlash of people saying he should be put on trial and his teacher should be put on trial and this real genuine societal fury about what was admittedly a fairly strange choice of words, but essentially was you know, a 14-year-old kid trying to talk about um, the horrors of war. Um, and I think that kind of shows that you know, they've really tapped into something. And actually, it was interesting to see the Kremlin trying to row back and sort of Peskov and people saying, you know, calm down. Uh, but people got really, really angry about that. Uh, which just, I think, is a sign of, of how powerful um, these kind of feelings have been. So that's a sort of very brief introduction, um, and I'd be very happy to talk. In more Great. Detail. So, so, Sean, thanks for the macro portrayal of what you're trying to do in the book, and I'd like to, if I could, sort of drag you into the micro, because part of yes. what I really enjoyed when I read the book um, were these portraits, where you basically give a huge amount of space in the book to using a couple of individuals especially to talk about the legacy of Stalinism. And there's this one woman, and I'm curious if you can just kind of share with us your experience, where you basically go through, there's a chapter in the book about Kolyma, which was one of the harshest or the harshest uh, parts of the gulag. And you become uh, connected to the region, you talk to uh, amateur historian, you talk to uh, people in Magadan, and then you meet this woman, Olga Guryeva. And my sense is her personal story is so uh, singular in some ways, but also speaks to this bigger national trauma. And I'm sort of curious if you can sort of walk people through her story and why you centered the discussion of the gulag around her. Mm -hmm. Sure. So yeah, so there were, there were kind of two portraits, right, in that, in that gulag chapter. Um, <coughs> one was her, and another one, which I'll come on to afterwards, was the this this uh, this amateur historian who'd sort of set up a museum of the Gulag in his own apartment, um, but Olga was was you know she was a, a frail uh, woman in her late eighties. Um, there aren't many um, survivors now, uh, and of, of the Gulag, and those that, that are alive um, often don't want to talk about it. So I was quite curious um, because you know you read I, I studied that, you know, the 30s in, 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 in uh, Soviet Russia at university, and you read about all these terrible things that happened, and you know that in sort of most Russian families there are these histories of repressions, so it becomes confusing why, why so many um, <coughs> Russians are able to be so kind of blasé about, um, about this, this sort of huge historical trauma, and, and why it's, you know, really quite widespread today in Russia to say, you know, well, you know, there were difficult times, of course there may have been some excesses, but... That was, that was the only option at the time. And so uh, Olga was someone who, she was born in Western Ukraine, uh, and she was uh, rounded up at the end of the Second World War when she was about, I think, 15. Um, so when the Nazis had, been, had invaded, uh, she'd been about 12. 
Uh, and she was accused of being a sort of dangerous um, Ukrainian nationalist, um, Nazi sympathizer, whatever, and was sentenced to 20 years um, in, in, of hard labor, katorga, uh, in the gulag. And, you know, it's this sort of almost, so I went to see her, she's now this very small old lady, and, and it's, you know, I'm not going to go through, it's just a sort of litany of, of sort of horrific experiences, basically. She was, took a month to get across Siberia on the train, almost dying on several occasions on the way, then taking this horrendous, essentially slave ship um, from Vladivostok to Magadan, which takes 10 days, um, and then years of, uh, 10 years of kind of horrible labor in a, in a tin mine, um, and then she was released, and when she was released, uh, the thing that, after Stalin had died in 1956, and she was released, but she wasn't allowed to leave Magadan, the far east of Russia. And she was told by the person who signed her release papers, you know, here's a word of advice, don't ever talk about this to anyone. Uh, and so she ended up marrying somebody who she met the day she was released, who'd also been released. And like after they'd spoken about their mutual experiences, they never spoke about it again to any of their friends. Uh, and you know, there's, there was this sort of awful moment where her son, in the I think late 70s, was um, being was a conscript in the army, and he was about to be sent to East Germany. Uh, and she sort of finds out that he, he is told, you know, you, you're, you're not going to be able to be sent to East Germany because your, your parents are enemies of the people. And that's the first time he's he heard about this. Um, so you sort of start to understand um, that people just didn't talk about this for, for years and years. And that it was, it was considered a taboo subject. You know, there was all this literature about people coming back from the gulag and, and never talking about it, or people whose parents died in the gulag and would then tell their children that the parents had actually died in the war because it was kind of shameful to have been in the gulag. Um, so you kind of end up with this, uh, I, I found her interesting as just a, on the one hand, it became clear why, why so few people knew about a lot of what happened during those years. But on the other hand, you know, here was someone and there were plenty of people like her certainly in the late 80s and early 90s, who were willing to talk about it and who had taken that step. Um, and yet, really, you know, you go to the main museum in Magadan and there's exhibits about the gulag and it's sort of all airbrushed. You know, you have a list of the number of passengers who arrived on boats during these years. And you think, well, hang on, someone like in the bottom of a freezing slave ship, is, it's a weird way to kind of call them a passenger. Um, and, you know, you, I went to talk to a local history teacher and she said, you know, well, look, I teach, the, I teach the gulag in this way. I say, you know, this is what the benefits of Stalinism were. Yes, there were some excesses. Like, you decide whether or not they were justified. And so this kind of comes back to this whole point of the war. And I think the, the importance of the war narrative has meant that, you know, for the war, the, the great victory in the war to make sense, um, you, you have to, at the very least, um, Minimize this 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 horrible gulag history. I don't know if you should I talk about the 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 Panikarov. The yeah, and also maybe you want to talk about her little brief sojourn living outside Russia, which I also thought was <laughs> yeah. quite quite bizarre. Yeah, no, I mean she was just a she was just a very sad story, really. She would she'd uh, yeah she she'd moved. She decided uh, in the nineties that she had this, a Ukrainian branch of a family that lived in Chicago, and she actually left Magadan and gone to live in Chicago for a year and just been so confused by it that she, she sort of couldn't quite understand and, and wanted to go back to Magadan and ended up moving back to Magadan. And then she moved to her home village in Ukraine as the sort of idea of, which, you know, we're talking sort of nine time zones away or something. Magadan's right in the far east of Russia. Uh, and that didn't work out either. Um, and, you know, it's, just, it's kind of just a miserably depressing story, really. Um, but, but I kind of found the, the, probably the most interesting guy and the most unexpected meeting I had in Magadan was I'd read about this guy, Ivan Panikarov, who um, in the late 80s, he'd become fascinated by the gulag and he'd started driving around these abandoned gulag sites, uh, which often weren't even marked on maps or whatever, and collecting the artifacts that he would find there. And he'd built this museum in his own flat and the, in this town that's about a 10 hour drive from Magadan. And I thought, fantastic, I'll go and see this guy. Like He's going to be the one guy that is really keeping this memory alive. Um, you know, in the face of all this apathy. So I showed up to meet him, uh, and he was sort of quite irritated to see me, it seemed. And, you know, he kept 
accusing me of, in, in the West of having a one-sided view about the Gulag. So, you know, the Gulag wasn't all that bad. And it turned out that in the intervening years, since I'd you know, read a story about him in the Russian press sort of seven or eight years ago, he kind of changed his whole view of the Gulag. And he said, you know, look, we mined 500 tons of gold in Kolyma, and, you know, without that gold, maybe we wouldn't have won the war. Uh, and, you know, it was a cruel time. But, but, but that's what happened. And so it was really fascinating to me that, like, you know, even the guy who has sort of spent his life kind of chronicling this, um, you know, he now saw himself not so much as a sort of chronicler of crimes, but remembering these, uh, you know, victims of a higher cause, if you like. And that, to me, was really symbolic of kind of how things have changed over the last years in Russia and that the view of those, those years. So if we can just go from the past horrors to contemporary horrors, there's another very memorable passage in the book, which is when you are in eastern Ukraine and you are interviewing the most notorious field commander, Bis, demon, with a Russian woman journalist and writer. And they take you into a dungeon and you meet and interview prisoners in the dungeon. And I'm just sort of, if you could just sort of recount both your experience with this, the, the very dangerous setting was, but then also you're reunited later with the prisoner that mm -hmm. you interviewed. Yeah, so I mean... And his views also, just like the Gulag historian, don't really align with what you right. would think the script would be. Right, so yeah, so I, yeah, I speak to a number of these, these kind of strange uh, men who ended up running their little fiefdoms uh, during the East Ukraine war. And Be Bess, the demon, the real name was Bezla, I was we were one of the scariest guys. Um, and so we went off, my, a friend of mine who's a, who's a Russian journalist, um, he didn't really give interviews, but one of the men fighting for him had read her stories and liked them, so kind of in, invited her to come and interview him. And I went along with her. Um, and he had, uh, he had a sort of uh, a basement full of prisoners, um, one of whom was this guy who was a sort of, he'd been, he'd been found with Ukrainian radical photographs on his telephone. Uh, and obviously, you know, when you're in a basement interviewing prisoners, there's not, you, there's not, you don't want to get into too much of a, of a discussion. So I just, you know, I, this guy told me that he'd been arrested for, for being a kind of pro-Ukrainian radical. Um, and then we got into this very messy situation um, where, where the demon got very angry and uh, sort of started threatening us, and it all got quite scary. Uh, this is a person who'd posted YouTube videos of himself apparently executing prisoners. Yeah. There's some question about whether he had actually executed them or not, but... Yeah, I think in the YouTube video, no, but in, real, in, in other cases, yeah, he, de he definitely has carried out a bunch of extra, extrajudicial executions. Uh, so he's a guy, he, he'd fought for years in the Russian Special Forces, um, but he, he was uh, from Ukraine. I think he's from Crimea originally. He speaks Ukrainian, um, the demon this is. Um, but a year later, I, I, was sort of, I met again um, this prisoner, this guy Vasil, who I'd met in the basement. Um, and he, you know, but at this point he was working, this was summer 2015, and he was working for the Ukrainian Defense Ministry to try and help further prisoner exchanges. And we started talking about the demon, uh, and I said, you know, he said, oh God, I remember the day you came, you know, he'd just executed a couple of people the, the day before, he was in the horrible mood, it was sort of, you know, you were really lucky to get out of there. Um, and then he, I started asking him uh, about, you know, did he know what had happened to the demon? Uh, and he said, oh, yeah, yeah, I Skyped with him a week ago, actually. Uh, so there was, what? Uh, and he said, oh, you know, the demon's like, I mean, you know, he did some terrible things. And, you know, he did some things that I would only talk about to a war crimes tribunal. But he's actually a pretty decent guy. <laughs> and I sort of said, you know, isn't there, a, isn't there a bit of a case of Stockholm syndrome here? I mean, surely he's just a nutter. Um, and he said, well, you shouldn't be so judgmental about people. You know, he... <laughs> Uh, this is a man who can recite like whole verses of Taras Shevchenko's poetry in Ukrainian. He was a guy in the early 90s, he wanted to fight for the Ukrainian army, but the Ukrainian army was just too busy stealing and he ended up going and fighting for the Russians. And you know, he's a guy who fought in Afghanistan, he fought in both Chechen wars. And you know, killing in a war, it kind of demeans you as a person, it's very hard to get over that. And he said, you know, you've got to remember that the demon 
uh, gave his allegiance to the Soviet Union. And I think, you know, you could say, talk about Russia or Ukraine, but I think he remained loyal to the Soviet Union. And, you know, you give, your, you give an oath to your motherland and then your motherland disappears and not everyone can handle that. Uh, and so obviously, I mean, this is a bit of an extreme uh, account, but, I, you know, this title of The Long Hangover, um, I think a lot of the, there's a lot of kind of middle-aged men in this book who, uh, who were just marooned and lost, really, by, you know, particularly people who kind of came of age around the time of the transition. Um, and, and, and really had this sort of huge psychological trauma, sometimes comes out in, in sort of less uh, violent ways, sometimes in the case of, of, of him or of the two other commanders that I write about in the book. Um, you know, they were all people who had, who had somehow seen this collapse as a real sort of psychological turning point. Um, and so that's sort of one of the themes that, uh, you know, that I explore. And I guess part of what Putin's task is to sort of try and overcome that broader trauma um, in the country. Um, and, you know, it's something if people have read uh, Svetlana Alexeyevich, I mean, something that she explores a lot um, is this sense of kind of the trauma of the post-Soviet human. So you were in Moscow for about 13 or 14 years as a correspondent. I'm sort of curious if you can talk a little bit about how difficult it was to operate as a Westerner in an environment that got progressively more entranced by this anti-Western ideology and by this sense of victimhood. Um, and, you know, my sense is, you know, a normal reporter in a normal country <coughs> has ideas. They bounce those ideas off of government officials or insiders or sophisticated outside observers, and they frame what they want to do um, for their stories or they follow the big issue of the day. But a Western correspondent in Russia today is seen, for the most part, as someone who's either there for ulterior reasons or who's there to you know, support Western policy or who just is a foreigner and isn't worth talking to. And I'm sort of curious how that experience has left you feeling now about uh, the role of foreign correspondents in an environment that's become progressively less hospitable. <coughs> <coughs> Well, actually, I would say um, the thing that I found most difficult to deal with was not so much aggression, and you, you, know, you do meet occasionally both officials um, or, uh, or just people that you're interviewing who are very aggressive. Um, one of the hardest things to deal with was actually people who uh, are very jovial. Uh, so, for example, you know, you'd of I'd often meet in eastern Ukraine, uh, you would meet uh, Russian state TV reporters or Russia Today reporters, um, and they'd be sort of very friendly, and they'd say, you know, wait, you know, let's forget the sort of ideology. You know, I'm, I've got my line, you've got your line. Uh, you know, I know that you're, you know, you're writing what you're told to write. I'm writing what I'm told to write, and like that's fine. That's what we do. But you know, let's have a drink. And you're sort of like, well, hang on a minute. I mean, I'm not trying to do that. I'm actually trying to, you know, uh, I, uh, I'm not told what to write, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. And even among um, even among uh, sort of a lot of very good and friends, there's a just a, a refusal to believe uh, in that it, that it might be possible to try at least to be an objective reporter uh, as as a concept. Um, and you know, I think that you know, obviously, there's good reporting on Russia and there's bad reporting on Russia, and there's a lot of things that that, that do play into stereotypes and so on. Um, but this idea that more or less. Uh, the majority of correspondents operating in good faith is is kind of seen as just a ridiculous sort of naive um, thing, and that that I've, that that sort of uh, everyday cynicism is almost harder, kind of psychologically, kind of taps away at you more than somebody just like shouting, "You're you know, you're a lying scumbag." Okay. Well, I, I'm sure that didn't feel good when it happened. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Well, look, let's open things up. Um, there's microphones. If People could do two things, uh, well, three things. One, wait for the microphone. Two, state your name and affiliation. And three, ask a short question that ends in a question mark. OK, and I will start up here, Annie, with this gentleman. Up here in the green. Thanks. Uh, hi, thank you so much for coming. It's so interesting. Um, my name is uh, Keith Weber. I'm a master's student at Georgetown. 
Um, so you, you talked about the kind of euphoria in 2014 uh, from the in, invasion and annexation of Crimea um, and, and kind of how Russians viewed that as a win. Um, and kind of from accounts now, it's sort of that euphoria is sort of gradually fading. Uh, is there any other place that you might have kind of come across in your reporting and interviews of Russians that could have a similar replicated effect? Uh, I feel like Crimea is somewhat unique in its cultural and historical uh, religious value for Russians and in fact in its role in World War II and all of that. Is there, I feel like Transnistria doesn't really play that same role. Uh, I'm curious your thoughts on if there is another sort of region like that uh, that has that might have that same effect. Yeah, I think I think you're right that sort of uh, Ukraine broadly and like Crimea specifically um, have this sort of visceral uh, visceral importance to Russians uh, that you know even um, you know a lot of people will really just struggle to see Ukraine as a as a real kind of thing, right? Um, and and you know I I would look at it a little bit more complicated, even that you know there are plenty of people. In eastern Ukraine and in Crimea, of course, who would who would also struggle to take Ukraine seriously as a as a real country without Russia or without you know being at least aligned with Russia. Um, so it's yeah, it's this really. Uh, I think um, you know you've got this 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 post imperial syndrome where um, all these other countries are split off, uh, but I think the way that the average Russians think about the Baltics or Transnistria uh, it, it doesn't even come close to the way they think about Ukraine and certainly about Crimea. And I think in terms of the, the same effect, you know, we've seen uh, we've seen kind of attempts to portray the Syria intervention um, in not obviously not in a similar way, but uh, as again as sort of Russia demonstrating that it has its red lines and that it's going to be active on the international stage, and that's had some resonance. Um, and you do talk to people who. Who kind of will say, oh, you know, Putin saved the world from World War Three with by fighting terrorists in Syria, but it doesn't quite have that same visceral kind of sense that Crimea had. Uh, as you say, there is also a sense now that it's that's that's wearing a bit thin. That uh, you know, that, that, that economically, it's a burden, um, and that you know, you can't you can't keep this euphoria going forever. But it, equally, you don't meet many people who say, you know, we should give Crimea back. Randy, Venus. Thank you very much. Randy Lavinas with the U.S.-Russia Business Council. I have a question following up from Andrew's question. Um, with the premise that, that things are bad for journalists and things getting worse over time, I mean, we can look at from the business community standpoint when 2014 was bad. Obviously, political relations, bad currently. But from the business community standpoint, I think we can see a difference between 2014 and today in terms of attitudes, um, where, where there hasn't been a turnaround, I would say, with Russia engaging with the West, but certainly from this moment when China and the East were much more, we talked about the pivot to Asia, there's certainly been a shift where there's more interest in looking back towards the West to do business. I'm just wondering from the journalistic environment, how you see that, is it, you know, to sort of take issue, I guess, with Andrew's premise in terms of it being hostile, has there been an improvement at all, if at all? Maybe not, but I'm just curious. You mean specifically in attitudes towards journalists, or? Um, I mean, it's this, it's a weird in, environment there. So, you know, you no, I think is the, is the answer. There's there's still, um, you know, I think the biggest problem with being a journalist and a foreign journalist in Moscow is access. So you know there there wasn't great access prior to 2014. It got worse around 2014, and it hasn't got any better. Um, you know, in terms of, you know, we're sort of by and large insulated from, um, or at least up to now, I've been insulated from the sort of violence or like actual physical attacks that sort of local Russian journalists would would face. Um, so, you know, you'd, you, I think I wouldn't I wouldn't exaggerate how difficult it is to operate just on in, on in, on a sort of terms of living there, right? You know, Moscow's a strangely enough since 2014 has become much more a pleasant city to live in, and you know, you, there are plenty of foreign journalists I know who live like really quite 
pleasant lives in Moscow, kind of going out to cafes and restaurants and coffee shops and, and, and you know, doing things that what, what I, part of the reason that um, so much of this book is reported from outside Moscow is that, you know, it is obviously this fascinating country where you can go and uh, so many extraordinary stories and human stories out in the regions, whereas if you sit in Moscow kind of trying to guess, uh, you know, what decision Putin's going to make tomorrow, it's journalistically very frustrating. So I would say, you know, in terms of access and in terms of sort of general aggression uh, towards the West, uh, it hasn't really got better. Uh, and, you know, there's, if you look at, um, I think, uh, uh, Masha Zaharova, the, who's the foreign ministry spokeswoman, uh, you know, she's a great example of this sort of duality, because on the one hand, you know, on the one hand, she's great because previously, if you wanted to get a quote from the foreign ministry, you'd have to uh, send them a fax and they wouldn't reply to you. And that's the end of it. Uh, now, you know, she's on Facebook. You can send her a message. You can go to them. She does an off-the-record briefing once a week. Um, but m most of those briefings will be her shouting at you. Um, so it's sort of of minimal use journalistically. You, know, you would normally, in, a, in London, you would go to an off-the-record briefing at the Foreign Ministry to find out, you know, the things they were really saying that they couldn't say publicly. There, you just sort of go and, and sort of, you might get a little bit of useful colour, but essentially you just get shouted at half an hour. Um, so, yeah, I, I don't think it's become uh, more welcoming, but equally I wouldn't sort of exaggerate that we're sort of scurrying around in, in fear for our lives. Kind of thing. So I've got two questions up here. I've got Hope and then Jeff. I'm sorry, Hope and then Wayne. I'm sorry, I'm going to put Jeff on the spot. Hi, Hope Harrison, George Washington University. Um, I teach courses on Russia and on uses and misuses of history okay. in politics. So um, I'm very excited about your book. And it reminds me a bit of David Remnick's Lenin's Tomb, which deals with Gorbachev's mm. approach to history, which was, of course, the opposite of Putin's, and in which he somewhat makes the argument that by opening up discussion of history and criticism of Soviet history at home and abroad, um, that's what brought the whole system down. Um, so I really look forward to reading your book and perhaps uh, having my students read it, too. Um, so I have two questions. Uh, one is this um, World War II focus. What happens with the next generation? How long is that going to sort of excite and motivate Russian citizens? Isn't that going to, you know, it's amazing it's gone on this long. You know, doesn't it have, have a bit of a short shelf life and sort of what's what's next and related to that as someone who studies the politicization of history i'm of course fascinated with this um topic and tend to pay a lot of attention to it but of course um your average russian citizen they're probably other things that affect their view of russia of putin of the world, um, <coughs> perhaps even more than this identity connected to World War II. And I'd be interested if you could talk about a couple of those things, sort of what else are the big factors that influence people's, you know, Russians' view of Putin and perhaps of the West? And does anyone ever talk about the fact that the U.S. also fought in World War II against Nazi Germany, or is that not talked about much? Okay, a lot of, uh, let's say, to start with, um, you know, the shelf life and, and how much young Russians think about it. So, I mean, one of the things that I found quite interesting, like, researching this book was that, uh, you know, there's there's a general belief in, 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 among most Russians today, actually, that the sort of the, the May the 9th celebrations and the, the sort of cult of victory has something that's been, you know, has been there forever since 1945. And that's kind of, it's kind of not really the case, right? There was, a, you know, the, in the kind of first two decades after the war, it was actually wasn't talked about that much. And then it became uh, what, what we're seeing now is a sort of resurrection of this kind of late Soviet cult where... Uh, you know, the sort of Brezhnev era stagnating Soviet Union uh, could no longer look forward to the sort of glorious communist future, so instead began to look past, to, to find its legitimacy in the past rather than the future. 
Uh, and you know, then you have the Gorbachev period, you have the Yeltsin period, where you know there were no there were no May 9th parades. Um, they started them again in 1996, but they were essentially kind of quite small things. And even I mean, even the first eight years of Putin, you didn't have like tanks rolling through the streets. Like this is all since 2008. Um, you know, there are, in terms of the shelf life of the idea, there are some surveys that suggest that sort of Russians are getting slightly less um, uh, sort of inspired by the victory narrative. But I would say, I mean, you know, it's, it's, I'm not suggesting that everybody's kind of consciously walking around and saying, you know, Russia, we, we are Russian and Russia means victory or whatever. But, you know, when you start the, this kind of epilogue of, of the book is a, is a trip I took to Irkutsk in, in February last year. And when you start uh, sort of actually looking, looking consciously for sort of stuff about victory, you suddenly notice that it's just sort of nibbling away at your subconscious from everywhere. So, you know, I, I'd, I'd gone there to do this story about these 80 people that had died from drinking a sort of fake bath fluid, really horrible story. It's sort of it's cheaper than vodka, so people drink it. Um, uh, but somehow a poisoned batch had come about, and 80 people had died. So I went to do this story. And you go, you go and talk to the doctor, and the doctor's got a May the 9th flag. You know, this was in February. The doctor's got a May the 9th flag on his desk. And you go outside, the, the ambulance has 1941 to 1945 written on it. And my, I get into the car, and my driver's listening to a documentary about the fall of Berlin. Uh, you know, I went to meet uh, like a young kid who was sort of fighting, uh, who was trying to fight this counterfeit alcohol, you know, doing this really, really quite good sort of volunteer work, trying to find this stuff in the shops and make sure people didn't drink it. And I say, you know, where are you from? And he says, I'm from this town. During the war, this town mined a lot of coal. Uh, and his first question is then, so he, you know, you ask about the, do Russians think about the US? I mean, his first question was, do, you know, in Britain, do they realize that Russia was, you know, won the war? And you sort of say, well, you know, maybe people don't know the details, but everyone kind of knows about the like, Battle of Stalingrad. Uh, uh, and he said, well, you know, uh, and, you know all, all of these questions were, were about, about Britain. Uh, and yeah, I don't think, uh, I think there are, I was just reading the other day, I can't remember the numbers, but there, there is, is a, um, an increasing number of people who, if you, when asked the question, you know, would the, would the Soviet Union have won the war without allies? Uh, it's gone gone up dramatically. People who say yes, they would um, in recent years. I think you know in Russia, there's a there's a really strong feeling, you know, possibly not with entirely without justification that kind of in the West people don't appreciate the the Soviet sacrifice, um, but that comes with this sort of concomitant thing that yeah, people don't even think about the the um, uh, any any sort of other allied effort. So when Mary. Thank you, uh, Wayne Mary, the American uh, Foreign Policy Council. There's an aspect of Russia that I'd like you to talk about since you were there um, even you know, about twice as long as I was. And this, Russia is a country that has a long history of diasporas and the influence of those diasporas on Russia. I mean, I happen to grow up in a small town in Oklahoma that was settled after 1905 revolution. My high school song's melody was God Save the Tsar. Um, <laughs> That was in the 1960s. Uh, but today, the Russian diaspora everywhere, uh, not just in Europe, not just America, but in China, in Latin America, in the Middle East, everywhere, it's an astonishingly large, astonishingly active, and it's you know, doing very well. It's not just oligarchs, but it sure isn't just taxi drivers. I think if you were to say, what is the third largest Russian urban area in the world, I would say it's Moscow, Petersburg, and then the diaspora. Uh, and I'm not sure it might even be bigger than, the, in, than, than Petersburg. Uh, what was your sense of the dynamics back and forth between the Russia within the Russian state and the Russia beyond the Russian state? Because certainly in my experience of Russians, I know this country and Russia, there's a lot of not just family connections, there are a lot of institutional connections, financial connections, cultural connections. Uh, not very much in the way of political connections, but I may just be missing that. But there has never in all of Russia's history been such a large, such a well-to-do, such a global Russian diaspora. So I'm, I'm, I'd like your thoughts from your, you know, your experience there. Uh, how does that play into Russia, not so much as a pol political entity, but Russia as a socio-economic, cultural uh, thing. How does the Russian nation within the Russian state 
relate to the Russian nation beyond the Russian state? <coughs> Excuse me. Um, yeah, I mean, I think there, there are obviously all these, uh, I mean, I think the interesting thing about the Russian diaspora is it's not homogenous, right? So there are all these completely different waves uh, of, of, of emigration at different times. So you, you know, the, the sort of the, the white Russian waves, my sense is that, you know, while, they're, while there are still people who sort of feel proudly that their, their great grandfather was a, a noble, a czarist noble, that, that that sort of strong Russian identity, I mean, that's slowly dying out. It's, it's a long time ago. Uh, you know, the, the sort of Jewish emigration of the 70s and 80s. Um, um, but I, you know, I think I don't see, uh, I haven't noticed it as a, as a particular force. I think what is, what is much more, uh, the, the part of the diaspora that is interesting uh, and is influential and is a subject of the sort of everyday discourse is the, is the post-Soviet diaspora. And, you know, Putin said in, the, in his speech, um, uh, kind of to the in the Kremlin on the annexation of Crimea, he said, you know, what Russians woke up and overnight Russians were the biggest diaspora in the world because we lost, um, you know, all these Russians sort of went to bed in their homeland and woke up in a foreign country. Um, so that that side of it, um, I think, is uh, is is very visceral and very important. Uh, in, obviously, other earlier waves of, of well, waves of emigration that came before, I think, you know, that there are obvious cultural and, and, um, and sort of family links, but I, it doesn't feel to me like something that plays a huge part in, in the discourse. Please, here. Thank you very much for your presentation and for your very useful work. Uh, I'm uh, Nikolai Vorobyov, I'm Ukrainian journalist and currently a research fellow at uh, John Hopkins University. So I have just a short remark and then a question. Mm -hmm. So remark about BS. I mean, these guys are very, they are very violent and uh, there is even a video which was released in June 2014 probably where they gunned down few Ukrainian prisoners. Somebody then told that it was a fake, but they did it publicly actually. So mm -hmm. they not only executed uh, Ukrainian uh, prisoners. That's, I mean, so they have nothing to do with uh, inter any international conventions. And yeah, this is a famous video, so you maybe can look at that. And I have a question. So you spend a lot of time in Russia. And uh, we know that most of Russian media, they are controlled by government, disinformation, propaganda, and so forth. Uh, do you use any Russian media as a source of information for you and for your work? Do you, still, do you believe that there is still some free media in Russia, like maybe RBK or uh, Dorsht, uh, Rain TV channel? or Echa Moskvi, or you think that it's just a fake, it's just a manipulation, and Kremlin is playing like this game, saying, pretending that they still have a liberal media. So the basic question, do you believe in liberal and free media in Russia? Thank you. Mm -hmm. uh, so just on your remark quickly, uh, so yeah, yeah, I obviously have seen this video, and in fact, the, the guy that I was, the guy that I was talking about who said he was still in, in Skype contact was one of the guys in that video, so it, it was a fake video. It wasn't a real execution. At the same time, uh, from this guy's testimony and from other people, we know that they were executing people. Um, and you know, by by sort of get, by portraying this guy's words that that he sort of was traumatized by the Soviet collapse, I'm not in any way trying to suggest that he wasn't um, a sort of thoroughly unpleasant criminal. Um, in terms of Russian media, yeah, I mean, I think it's. Um, over the years that I've been working there, you've, it's, it, you know, it's never been uh, a sort of flourishing, fantastic media scene, but you've seen these small islands get smaller and smaller, uh, and you've seen sort of places that were doing really, really good stuff being uh, taken over um, and, and having the editors changed. Uh, I still think there, there are a few kind of places that are uh, still genuinely independent. There are places that, you know, you say, is it all part of this Kremlin game? And I think there are, there are times when sort of both things are true. So, you know, Echo Moskvi uh, clearly play, which is, you know, the liberal radio station in Moscow, but is owned by Gazprom Media. Clearly it plays to certain rules, like Benediktov, the editor-in-chief, is, is, you know, he's a very wily operator. Um, he knows where, you know, he, he's very well connected. And you know, tomorrow it could be closed down. Um, but that doesn't mean that sort of that there aren't there aren't real journalists working there doing 
decent stuff. Um, so yeah, I think uh, the, the, the you know Dodge, the Abukar, the places you mentioned uh, over the past two three years, uh, Novak Azerta have done some great stuff. At the same time, uh, you know we've seen it with Vedamasti, we've seen it with Abukar. Uh, we've seen it with Gazetta Roo, seen it with Lenta Roo, that these things, places that are doing good stuff get kind of slowly and slowly crushed and uh, it gets smaller and smaller. And, you know, yeah, now you've got uh, a lot of a lot of good journalists without jobs in Russia because there are so few places that you can, that real journalists could work. So we have time for two more questions. I know a lot of people are trying to get a word in. And then there's going to be books for sale and a reception behind that door where you can uh, pose those extra questions to Sean and buy copies, many copies of his book, um, and, and get him to sign it. So I'm gonna take two more questions. I've got Jeff and then Gerard, please. Uh, thank you, I'm Jeff Mankoff with CSIS. Um, I was trying to remember who famously said that Russia was a country with an unpredictable past, but your remarks today have um, just emphasized um, the truth of, of that observation. Um, one of the things that I find striking about this unpredictable past is the way in which Putin has effectively integrated memory of the Soviet period with that of the, the czarist period, so that there's almost not a contradiction between the two. Um, and I wondered if you could talk a little bit based on your experience and the, the work that you've done in this book, um, how much resonance um, the pre-Soviet period has with ordinary people? How much do people identify with symbols, ideas, um, memory of things that happened you know, before 1917 and how effective are they at kind of holding together that contradiction between embracing a pre-Soviet past, but also a Soviet past? Yeah, I mean, I think uh, certainly, especially in the past few years, you've sort of seen this, um, you know, you've kind of seen the 1945 thing augmented with all these other um, figures or events going right back to the sort of giant um, monument to Vladimir the Great, which has gone up outside the Kremlin. Um, you know, in the, in, during the opening ceremony of this monument, it was never once mentioned that he was um, the Prince of Kiev. Um, so you have this kind of, you know, millennia-long um, lineage from Vladimir the Great to Vladimir Putin. Uh, and, you know, I think Putin's quite consistent in, in his, if you, if you want to call it a philosophy, that, that sort of, you know, state, a strong state is good and state collapse is, is bad. So you can... Di you can uh, not be happy about 1917 revolution, but you can say that the the sort of strong state that grew from that uh, is a positive thing that should be celebrated. Um, but I think you know where he has to be quite careful, and where he is quite careful is that you know there's still, as we saw this past year, there kind of isn't really a consensus on 1917, and there you know there are some people who uh, sort of uh, you know extremely big fans of Nicholas II get very excited about Tsarism and think the revolution was a tragedy and other people who think it was fantastic and that sort of Putin has to play to both those constituencies. So I kind of guess he's, you know, he's, he's always like very, very careful on the occasions that he talks about Lenin or he talks about the revolution. Um, and, but at the same time, you know, yeah, we have seen this sort of, um, you know, monument to Alexander III, monument to Vladimir the Great, monument to Stolypin, uh, kind of uh, filling in this, this narrative of a sort of, you know, long running tapestry of, of kind of Russian greatness where basically, you know, you can be, you can support the current Russian state and the Soviet Russian state and the Tsarist state, but you can see 1917 and 1991 as tragedies at, at the same time because, you know, state, state collapsing, whether it's in 17 or 91 or in Maidan in Kiev or in Syria, is always a negative thing for Putin. Right. Um, hi, Sean. I'm uh, Gerard Toll. I'm a professor. So my allegiance is to the Enlightenment. Um, I, I, I want to thank you first. Uh, the book is terrific. Uh, I would really strongly recommend it. Um, uh, thank you on behalf of the uh, researchers who um, study conflict um, and uh, don't have access to or don't undertake the very hard work of 
and putting your sort of neck on the line to go and uh, report on very uh, live conflicts as you have done in Georgia and also in Ukraine. Um, I, I wanted to ask about the process of the work itself, which is that as a foreign correspondent and you know, as a correspondent for The Guardian, and we should all should subscribe to The Guardian, pay money because this is not free. But as a correspondent, you're working with the deadline. And so there's a, a certain instant history that is created, the first draft of so-called first draft of history. The writing of a memoir is a contemplation. It is a, where you get to think about and edit uh, on your own, not have an, an editor or do it for you. Um, so I wanted to ask you to talk to us a little bit about the potential disjuncture between your kind of filed reports and then you're thinking about what went on later in the light of what happened and whether you felt that sir, looking back on those reports, maybe you were sort of uh, on the wrong track, or perhaps you are captured by a kind of prevailing wisdom at a certain time, and so on and so forth, or you later came to appreciate something. If you could talk to us a little bit about, the, uh, if someone wants to read your trans, uh, the your dispatches, and then read this memoir, what would you say to them about the the journey between those two? I mean, I think, you know, the first thing is, is the, there's obviously like a procedural thing that as a, a correspondent for a daily newspaper, uh, you know, if, if you don't tailor what you're doing with very much with a book in mind, uh, you end up with sort of, you know, 2,000 fascinating vignettes um, and no through arcs of sort of characters that you've followed uh, and, and seen their progression or and so on. Uh, and... Uh, so, you know, for me, uh, it was something, uh, you know, I, because I'd been in, in Russia for so long and I'd always had the idea of doing a book. And then when things started really happening in 2014, uh, it became clear that this was like really quite an extraordinary moment. And so that from that point, it's sort of in the back of your mind that um, at some point I'd like to, I don't quite know what it's going to look like yet, but I'd like to turn this into a book. So you might, you know, you'd just spend like five times longer with somebody um, than you would if you were just getting your sort of three quotes with them um, for the daily newspaper, or you would, you know, you would go back and revisit the same people again and again. Um, in terms of sort of, uh, you know, changing of views, I mean, I think, you know, of course, it's always, uh, you know, you always look back at things and, 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 and sort of see things that seem more significant that at the time didn't quite seem so significant. Certainly, you know, things like, uh, uh, you know, p people in like people in Kiev will often get, you know, irritated and justifiably so that the country is largely covered by Moscow correspondence um, and not by Kiev correspondence or by Warsaw correspondence or whatever. I mean, I do think you know it would be great if everyone had a Kiev correspondent, but I I, I do think there are probably more similarities in in the sort of issues that Ukraine and Russia face that, than many people in Kiev would like to admit, but. Uh, but that's another matter. But certainly, you know, I feel like going into a huge, you know, I dipped in and out of Ukraine. I knew people in Ukraine. I'd done stories in Ukraine. But being thrown into this uh, incredibly complicated story of, of, of Maidan and everything around it without having done the kind of reading that I later did around the sort of history and the historical currents involved, um, I think maybe, uh, you know, uh, as in, in many conflicts, in many cases, we have all benefited from from kind of understanding the context a bit more than, than you do in, in the heat of the moment. Um, but I think, you know, I've, I feel quite lucky that the, the Guardian is, is somewhere that, you know, first of all, um, you know, I don't feel any kind of pressure at all to follow a particular line. And that we're also given leeway to sort of, yeah, go to Magadan for a week and, and talk to people and not always having to file for the sort of hourly web updates and things. So I did feel like, you know, I. I hope that uh, you know, naturally daily news reporting is, is something you do quickly and could always be improved. But I, I don't look back and sort of think like, God, what a load of absolute crap I wrote. <laughs> Hopefully, maybe other people might think differently. Okay. Well, Sean, you've been very generous with your time. It's a terrific book. And I encourage folks to go in the back and buy a copy from you. Thank you very much. Thanks for coming. Thank you.